from World News Tonight. Concerning tremor. Indonesia on high alert as earthquakes cause major damage to infrastructure. Grim milestone. Many more lost to the clutches of the pandemic with the United States seeing a record-breaking death toll. Historic meeting. Israel and United Arab Emirates come together for the first time in discussions of diplomacy. Celebrating St. Lucia. Kayaks lit with Christmas spirit float through canals under moonlight in remembrance of hope and cheer. From the global resources of the Verna Media Network, this is Other Verna World News Tonight. Now reporting from Studio 24 in Colombo, here's Anuradhi Wickramasinghe. Good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. We start off today's coverage with updates on a major earthquake in Indonesia. A tsunami warning issued after a powerful 7.4 magnitude earthquake struck eastern Indonesia was lifted by the local meteorological agency after around two hours. The quake, which struck in the Flores Sea, sent residents fleeing from their homes and caused damage and also injured some. The meteorological agency said at least 15 aftershocks followed, with the biggest registering a magnitude 5.6. However, the quake caused no significant increase in sea levels. The disaster mitigation agency said a school building and several homes were damaged on Selayar Island in South Sulawesi. Eyewitness video showed dozens gathered along streets in East Nusa Tenggara province, while people could be seen fleeing a shopping mall in nearby South Sulawesi province. The quake struck about 112 kilometers northwest of the town of Larantuka in the eastern part of Flores Island at a depth of 12 kilometers. Meanwhile, in the U.S. as well, natural disasters have struck as hundreds of homes and businesses in neighborhoods of Bowling Green, Kentucky are unrecognizable after a deadly tornado outbreak. And in the hard-hit Warren County, the death toll is still rising. Early morning sun reveals the scars that will not soon disappear from the path the tornadoes cut through homes, businesses, and lives. But first light also reveals something about who we are. Time and time again, when we witness moments of great trauma, we see moments of teamwork. In Arkansas, neighbors collecting clothing at local schools. This will be going on as long as we need it to. Or strangers from across the street or across state lines coming to help. Whether to share a prayer. Understand that you love us and you understand that we get a chance to work through you. Or help pick up the pieces. We need a truck and probably about four dudes to help move a refrigerator. Retired Green Beret Jeremy Locke is with Aerial Recovery a group of former military who rush in to volunteer after natural disasters. I've been to a lot of places and this place is devastated. There's a lot of need out here, so anything can help. Offering aid to Royce Buck, who's just beginning to process it all. Have people come in and say, we're going to help you get to the next day. Uh, it, it, I, I, there's no words for it. In Campbellsville, Kentucky, ER nurse Chris Wilson has been one of those volunteers. Now he is the one who needs help. Close community and good neighbors, good friends. Coming together to lend a hand to those most in need. Now on to the updates of the COVID pandemic. Still in the U.S., it's been one year since the first doses of the Pfizer COVID vaccine rolled out. But there's a new wave of hospitalizations overwhelming healthcare staff. It comes as the U.S. hits a grim milestone of 800,000 deaths from the virus. Inside the nation's busiest hospitals, there was no time to reflect on the loss. As our nation surpasses a staggering 800,000 deaths, the most devastating wave of COVID infections is right now overwhelming many medical centers across the Northeast and Great Lakes. More national disaster teams are arriving at hospitals as the U.S. now tops 50 million cases. Spectrum Health West in Michigan just set their single-day record for new admissions and expect to break it every day this week. As hospitalizations rise 37 percent, the steady and relentless climb to 800,000 lives lost took under two years. According to the CDC, 76 percent of deaths are those 65 and older. But the numbers are names for families who lost loved ones like Diana Sawhill. 
While Delta does damage, Omicron is fueling new concern. California set to re-implement indoor mask mandates as cases skyrocket 47 percent since Thanksgiving. It took less than two weeks for the highly infectious mutation to be identified in half the country. Boosters say experts are our best defense, but tonight for 800,000 families, it's far too late. Meanwhile, at least one COVID-19 patient in the UK has died with the highly transmissible Omicron variant, which the country's health authorities are saying the strain is spreading at a phenomenal rate. For further details, let's cross over to Other Than the World News Special Correspondent Malshi Abesekra reporting from Norwich in the United Kingdom for more. Malshi? Yes, Sanuradi. They expect the variant to become the dominant strain in 24 to 48 hours. Amid the rapid spread of the Omicron variant, the UK has reported its first death from the strain, saying the country had sadly witnessed the loss of a patient who had been infected with the Omicron variant. British Prime Minister Boris Johnson said the variant should not be taken lightly. Since the country detected its first Omicron case in late November, Johnson has imposed tougher antivirus measures. He also urged the public to get booster shots to prevent the health service from being overwhelmed. Explaining that the new mutation is spreading at a phenomenal rate, Britain's health secretary said that the Omicron variant now accounts for nearly 44% of all COVID-19 infections in London. This comes as citizens scramble to get COVID testing kits and appointments for boosters due to high demand. Back to you, Anurathi. Thank you. That was other than the World News Special Correspondent Malshia Besekra reporting from Norwich in the United Kingdom. Australia is preparing for a major jab boost as it was announced that vaccine producer Moderna will soon be setting up manufacturing facilities for the mRNA vaccine in the country. For more on this, let's cross over to other than the World News Special Correspondent Timothy Phillips from Melbourne in Australia for more. Timothy? Yes, I'm Rani. Australian Prime Minister Scott Morrison said, U.S. drug maker Moderna Incorporated will produce mRNA vaccines a year in Australia after agreeing to set up one of its largest manufacturing facilities outside the United States and Europe. Prime Minister Morrison said the plant in Victoria State was expected to produce up to 100 million mRNA vaccine doses every year when it begins operations in 2024. He did not specify the financial details of the agreement but Australian media reported the deal could be worth about 2 billion Australian dollars. Australia has inoculated nearly 90% of its population above 16 with two doses and shortened the wait time for a booster shot after the emergence of the Omicron cases. This comes as Australia said it will shorten the wait time for people to receive COVID-19 booster vaccines following a rise in cases of the Omicron variant. Back to you, Arvati. Thank you. That was Other Than the World News Special Correspondent Timothy Phillips reporting from Melbourne in Australia. On the diplomatic end, President Moon Jae-in arrived in Australia for a four-day state visit. The trip comes as Seoul and Canberra mark 60 years of diplomatic relations this year. Bolstering cooperation in green energy and future high-tech industries is expected to top the agenda when President Moon Jae-in holds a summit with Australian Prime Minister Scott Morrison on Monday. Moon arrived in Canberra a day earlier for a four-day state visit. He is the first foreign leader to visit the country since it shut down borders in 2020 and is the first South Korean president to make a state visit to Australia in 12 years. The Blue House says the leaders will discuss cooperation in the fields of carbon neutrality, hydrogen economy, defense space and cyber technology. On the occasion of Moon's visit, South Korea and Australia will also formally elevate their relationship to comprehensive strategic partnership, especially as this year marks six decades of diplomatic ties. Moon and Morrison have already met twice this year, on the sidelines of the G20 summit in Rome in October and G7 in Cornwall in June. Another goal of Moon's visit is to secure a stable supply of raw materials and key mining products. South Korea sees Australia as a potential partner for battery minerals such as lithium and essential minerals necessary for future industries such as electric cars. Last month, Australia also provided urea solution to South Korea to ease a local shortage caused by China's tightened urea exports. South Korea is Australia's fourth largest trading partner, while Canberra is Seoul's eighth largest. Also on Monday, President Moon will pay respects at the Australian National Korean War Memorial and have dinner with Australian veterans of the 1950-53 Korean War.
Let's go in for a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. Welcome back. The U.S. Congressional Committee probing the deadly January 6th assault on the Capitol voted to seek contempt of Congress charges against Mark Meadows, who served as White House Chief of Staff to former President Donald Trump. The House Select Committee investigating the January 6th deadly Capitol riot involving a mob of Donald Trump supporters voted to recommend the Department of Justice hold Trump's former Chief of Staff Mark Meadows in criminal contempt of Congress. The committee doing so after Meadows didn't show up for his deposition last week and despite a last minute letter from his lawyer urging the committee not to rush to judgment. Before the vote, the select committee released a 51 page report alleging that just ahead of the January 6th attack on the Capitol, Meadows expressed in an email that the National Guard would be available to quote, protect pro Trump people and that more would be on standby. The report is based on 6,000 documents Meadows voluntarily turned over before he stopped cooperating. The report also claims Meadows played other roles in the events leading up to and on January 6th, including exchanges between him and members of Congress who pressed him to have President Trump issue a statement telling rioters to leave the Capitol. Meadows' lawyer claimed his client can't testify because he's bound by Trump's claims of executive privilege. The former chief of staff now suing Speaker Nancy Pelosi and the select committee for advancing the contempt proceedings. Several other Trump confidants are refusing to cooperate, but the committee says they've interviewed almost 300 witnesses. If the DOJ gets the criminal contempt referral, they would determine if Meadows will face prosecution or not. The European Union imposed sanctions on Russian private military contractor Wagner Group, as well as on eight individuals and three other energy companies in Syria, accused of helping to finance the mercenaries in Ukraine, Libya and Syria. Shadowy Russian military company, the Wagner Group, has been slapped with sanctions by EU foreign ministers. Some of its assets will be frozen, and eight individuals and three firms linked to the company have also been targeted. The company, which allegedly has links to the Kremlin, has taken part in operations across the globe, including alleged torture and extrajudicial killings. The activities of this group reflects the Russia hybrid warfare. They present a threat and create instability in a number of countries around the world. The Wagner Group is active in at least 12 countries around the world, including Syria and Libya. But first emerged in Ukraine, where its mercenaries fought alongside pro-Russian separatists, ultimately assisting in Moscow's annexation of Crimea and conflict in the Donbass region. The Wagner Group is also present in multiple countries in sub-Saharan Africa, including the Central African Republic. For his part, Vladimir Putin claims the group has no links to the Russian state and denies any wrongdoing. The Abu Dhabi Crown Prince hosted Israel's Prime Minister Naftali Bennett in the first ever public meeting between the United Arab Emirates de facto ruler and an Israeli leader. Israel's Prime Minister Naftali Bennett met with Abu Dhabi's Crown Prince, Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed al Nahyan, on Monday in the UAE in what the Israelis are describing as a historic encounter because it was the first ever public meeting between an Israeli leader and the UAE's de facto ruler. An honor guard welcome for Bennett as he met the UAE's foreign minister a day earlier. The trip is the latest push in Israel's recent attempt to strengthen its relationships with Muslim-majority neighbors in the region, an initiative led by the United States. Diplomatic ties between Israel and the UAE, for one, were only formalized last year. Trade between the two countries has skyrocketed in that period, from about $125 million in 2020 to $500 million so far in 2021. Israel's ambassador to the UAE says the tricky issue of Iran, Israel's biggest rival, was one item on the agenda between the prime minister and crown prince. 
The UAE has actually been trying to improve its relationship with Iran, and Washington is expected to warn Emirati banks about breaking sanctions related to Iran this week. Tunisian President Kai Saeed said Tunisia would hold a constitutional referendum next July, exactly a year after he seized broad powers in moves his opponents called a coup, and that parliamentary elections would follow at the end of 2022. Kai Saeed. He's the president of Tunisia and will remain so until at least the end of next year. Elections to restore a semblance of democracy. Last July, Kai Saeed suspended parliament and dismissed the prime minister, consolidating power for himself. Laying out the timeline for his proposed path out of the country's political limbo, Saeed also announced a three-month popular consultation ahead of a constitutional referendum in July 2022. Since this summer, thousands of people have been demonstrating throughout the country for a return to democracy. Tunisia has had nine governments since its 2011 revolution, many of them short-lived or fractured. Deep-rooted problems of unemployment and crumbling state infrastructure that were behind the uprising have never been resolved. COVID-19 has only made things worse, fueling long-standing public frustration. Welcome back. For more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. The Turkish lira has fallen to a new record low amid fears that the central bank will make a further cut in interest rates later this week. The currency is now worth about half its value at the beginning of the year. Max Verstappen clinched his first Formula One world title when he won a dramatic season-ending Abu Dhabi Grand Prix, but only after two protests from Lewis Hamilton's Mercedes team were rejected. Multiple people were killed after a gas explosion caused several buildings to collapse in Ravalusa on the Italian island of Sicily. The Biden administration has announced its first sanctions over alleged human rights abuses by North Korea. It included various organizations connected to the North as well as the current Minister of People's Armed Forces. At a G7 meeting in the UK over the weekend, the top diplomats of South Korea and Japan met face to face for the first time. However, during their brief chat over dinner, South Korean officials said they merely reaffirmed the sizable gap between the two countries over historical issues. The Cumbre Vieja volcano on Spain's La Palma Island surpassed the record for the longest eruption on the island since records began in 1585. And finally, tonight, hundreds of kayaks decked with Christmas lights and decorations lit up the winter darkness as they floated through the canals in central Copenhagen to celebrate St. Lucia's Day. Bystanders watched from streets and bridges around the city as around 700 kayaks moved along the canal for a parade to bring light into the darkness. Gustavo Cordes, the manager of the kayak bar that organizes the event, said the Santa Lucia event is something that is bringing light to people in darkness. At four stops along the route, the participants stopped off for some traditional singing. Apart from having to decorate the kayaks and to dress warmly, one should also fall into the dark and cold water. The only rule was to have 360-degree visible lights on the kayaks. The best decorated kayaks received a bottle of champagne. In case you have missed any of the stories we aired tonight, you can rewatch by catching us on our YouTube page, youtube.com slash other than English. And that's all the news we have for you tonight. Suzanne Shanali will join you again tomorrow with another edition of World News. I'm Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. Until then, stay safe and have a great night.